You are listening to The Curator Podcast, Season 2, Episode 23, The Return of Chris Cresswell from the Flatliners. Chris Cresswell, Hello. singer of Flatliners and now podcast host. Part two, yeah. <laughs> our part two. Yeah, that's our part yeah. two. But let's talk about the podcast, man. Let's sure, fucking let's man. get into that shit. Yeah, I want to move my seat back. Oh, he's moving his seat. We're in, we're in Mark's car. Yeah. We were in our van last time. Yeah. The van we borrowed. We don't have a van over here. Yeah. That'd be cool, though, because that'd be like the modern day punk equivalent of a huge band having a plane. <laughs> yeah, we got a van in England. Yeah, just, sure. just sitting there, yeah. Scotland, sorry. Shit. Off to a terrible start. See, I, I didn't notice I that. Gotta go, I gotta go fucking back to bed and start my day over again, man. I, I heard that Slipknot have, like, their own gear in Europe. Yeah, I believe it. Like, yeah, how yeah. the fuck can you afford that? Like, I mean, they're huge. I mean, <laughs> Sli- uh, uh, Slayer has a truck over here somewhere. Uh, maybe not in the UK, maybe actually in Europe, but uh, they have... They have it all decked out. It's like all painted black, and like the Slayer logos on the outside. We drove past it one time. I'm like, holy shit, that's that, that's like some huge Slayer fan. And then our friend that was driving us on that tour was like, no, that's their gear. They're definitely here on tour, and they have a truck of their own. But anyways, I'm sorry, podcast. Yeah, let's go. Let's go to that. Yeah, yeah man. So um, we, talk, we spoke. We didn't speak about it on the podcast, but after the podcast last time, you said you were going to do it. And yeah, I'm so fucking happy. You did, didn't you? <laughs> I am too. I'm happy. You're happy. Uh, it was definitely, yeah, it was something I've been thinking about and kind of compiling stuff for for a while. Um, the very first interview I did was just before the tour I saw you on last. Mm-hmm. The second one I did was the Menzingers one, which was only a few days after I saw you last. Um, and then I've just been kind of piecing other things together. And, you know, we've been on the road so much, and we're, we're so we're so busy in that respect. But typically there's a lot of downtime as well. And I guess I just have no interest in free time whatsoever, because other than that, I'm already a pretty busy guy. But I just love it, you know? Um, And I got into it more recently than not, I guess. And I really enjoy now having spent so much time this year, or just most years, on the road playing music. I love listening to music too, but if there's there's a, a part of me now that is looking for something else to occupy my time with if I'm not listening to music, if I'm going for a walk, whatever it is, it's a podcast. Mm-hmm. So it's been fun to work on it. And now you can talk about music as well. So I know, like... it's the best. <laughs> oh my God, I've just, I found the way to put them together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, it's good that you're enjoying it, man. Um, have you banked a lot of content? And if you've got a lot of interviews in the bag, you're ready to go sort of thing? I have, I have banked a little bit. I've banked a lot of content. Mm-hmm. I have banked... Hashtag content. Hashtag content, yeah, quality, (laughs) premium quality content. Uh, I have banked some interviews that have not seen the light of day yet, and I'm working on more coming up. But that's the thing, it's like now I'm trying to just, you know, we play with so many great bands and I want everyone to be on it, but that's the biggest challenge now is the day-to-day hustle of touring and setting up gear and sound checking and doing all these tiny little things that occupy most of your day when you add them all up. It's kind of hard sometimes to find half an hour or whatever, to sit down with your friend and talk about something, only because I feel like maybe it could feel forced. You have to make it this good thing because you don't have those two hours to draw from and maybe edit down. But to be honest, so far I've just been sitting down with a friend for like 20 minutes, half an hour maybe, and that's it. So you don't and then we just, we no just chat. questions or anything? Just we like, just, I, yeah. I have like a couple ideas, things prepared, yeah. but it's usually just... I mean, you can have everything so prepared with anything you do in life, and then it just everything else will probably happen. Yeah. So, <laughs> I think from my experience, sometimes, man, like I've done a few interviews where even with questions prepared, it's been a it's felt like pulling teeth at the time. And yeah, when you've got that, like when you've only got like that thirty minutes, yeah, uh, there is that pressure. Well, I feel that kind of pressure to, like you say, to make it good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you can't just like mark mad on that shit and cut it all down <laughs> and make it sound slick and amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of challenges as well, which no doubt you've come across with, uh, you know, trying to find a quiet place. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, like, some some PR people have been cool about that, but I was just kind of like, oh, yeah, so do you want to, like, just do it, you know, in the, in the, in backstage area? And I'm like, probably not, because, you know, there's music and shit. That's and the thing, that's man. That's a bit of an issue. I mean, before we left to go to your car, 
I mean, there's a room we could have gone in, but there's three bands hanging out in it right now. And then Shit Present, who are great. Shout out Shit Present. They're about to start, uh, so it'll be loud. You know, and it's, yeah, it's just, it's tough to find that quiet space. And that's, that is, that's probably the biggest, actually, that's the biggest challenge while you're doing it on tour, is finding a quiet place. Because there's no, there's never, there's never a quiet place or a place you can be, like, just on your own with someone else. You know, you're always in, like, the horde. You're always in the group, in the crew, uh, which is great. I mean, that's, that's like, one of my favorite parts about being on the road. But when you're trying to get this more intimate conversation down, yeah. you don't want other shit going exactly. on. So it's, yeah, it, it, it's a learning process for me, and I think it must be for everyone. It probably still is for yourself. Yeah. But I like it because, I mean, there's a lot. We've, over the years, made a lot of great friends and even just, like, people that I don't know as well, uh, but who, you know, have a story, too, you know? And I want to show people um, all the, I don't know, feathers to the touring bird kind of thing, you know what I mean? Like, because there's a lot of different people out there coming from a lot of different places that could tell, a, a you know, a lot of different stories. So it's it's not always going to... I hope it's not always people in bands. Um, that just was the most natural way for me to lead the thing off uh, but we'll see where it goes yeah yeah. I had the same thing like I was always hoping it was, was going to be people in bands but, but I've been part of music and it's been part of my life for so long yeah. and I've kind of got the, the contacts and, and the industry I'm using mm. air quotes for that um, <laughs> to make it the easiest avenue for me to talk to people just by sending an email and going hey I did this can, can we do this kind of thing mm. but I would like it to be like more like writers and you know yeah, like I artists mean, and stuff anyone like right yeah because yeah. Yeah. I mean you know you need that I th- a lot of what, uh, my, the enjoyment I get out of listening to a podcast is trying to learn something. Or if, if it's like, a you know, I listen to a couple comedy podcasts and I just laugh. But at the same time, you look back and you think like, oh, maybe I, I learned something from that joke. I don't know. I mean, like, I'm a fan of comedy as well. Mm-hmm. You, you're always learning and you're always progressing. You're always becoming, hopefully, a better version of yourself. Uh, so even through just a couple... Cheeky laughs, you think that's all it is in the moment. You can look back and think, like, oh, I actually did learn something from that. So all that to say, the the, the grander the, pers- the perspective is, then I think the more you'll learn, yeah. you know. So if I, if I keep just talking to musicians or if there was a podcast, you know, where it was just novelists or just, I don't know, audio engineers or fucking time travelers, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, actually, that would be awesome. But, you know, it's... The point to me of all this kind of sharing information, and now I'm using air quotes, is to, I don't know, just, I guess, just reveal a part of yourself being, let's say, sorry, of, of the, the guest revealing something of themselves that the general public didn't know before. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just sharing that information that people may not have known. That's, 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 that's all it I is. Hope for. Like, that's what yeah. it's really hard sometimes, especially if it's like people that are in like, really popular bands mm. and they've been asked all the fucking questions under the sun and you're sure. like how am I going to approach this you know yeah. I mean? and that kind of freaks me out well it's a good thing you got someone in a not as popular band then, right here dude. you guys are <laughs> you guys are one of my favourite bands of all time like thank you very much I, very cool. I don't think I've actually ever said that live in this podcast before <laughs> it's genuinely true though like that's one of the things I want to talk about is like 10 years ago man The Great Away came out and mm. when I fucking heard that record it just blew my mind at the time <laughs> thanks man it was one of those things I was like fuck what is that sound how do I make that sound? <laughs> and when can I see this sound live? And my girlfriend, too, met last time. Like, we've been together for so fucking long, man. And it's one of the records we bonded over was that one as well. Do you know what That's I mean? great. And it's like, she's she's kind of past music now. She's grown up. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, man. I mean, people, <laughs> people do move on from music, which to me is obviously fucking crazy because yeah. it's my <laughs> life. But I understand that there's a lot more out there than just music. But, I mean, if I were an actor... Or if I were a banker, you know what I mean? Like your life would be different. Obviously, life or obviously music is my life because I'm a musician. But it's funny though when you see people, even especially like your your partner, like your best friend, mm-hmm. you see something in them change. Or if it's a family member or whatever, and you like this one thing they were really into, it can change in time. You know, because you just as you grow older, you realize there are other things you could be good at or you're just interested in and like you know seeing how where life takes you is that's the that's i think that's the point mm-hmm. of life is just seeing where you can go priorities change as well exactly you know, yeah, yeah, yeah you got to keep that door open 
to it, I think. I find that sometimes I worry that the connection might disappear, but let's just get into a very different kind of podcast. So <laughs> let's, not, let's not go down there. Um, but The Great Awake is 10 years old, which is probably what to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, it feels like, are you going to be playing a lot of songs? Are you playing a lot of songs from this tour because of that? We're playing, we're playing a few. We're not going too deep into it, only because it's funny that we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of... The Great Awake, the same year we have a new record. Yeah, out. You know what I mean? So it's kind of yeah. tough to uh-huh. find the balance between the two. We are playing some songs of The Great Awake, but it's not like the shows we're doing at the end of the year where we're playing the whole record. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I don't know. If, if those shows go well, that could be a cool thing to do. Yeah. I don't know how realistic it is, so I probably shouldn't have even said that. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, it's been really, really cool. I mean, to think back... It's kind of scary. It's been ten years, but it's it is really cool to think back. It's scary that, for me as well, man. Like when I, when I read it, I was like, "What?" <laughs> There's been a lot of reminiscing on this tour. There's been some venues we played on this tour that we played the very first time we came over here as well, which was nine years ago when we were touring the Great Awake. So there's a lot of reminiscing happening. It's cool, man. I mean, I can't believe it's been ten years. Really, I can't believe we spent. I mean, we've talked about, I think we probably talked about it last time, like we spent 10 years on fat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That seems crazy to me, even more now that we're celebrating the anniversary of that album, like the first album with fat. Um, Yeah, because then you think, I turn 30 next month. Uh, So you think like, what the fuck do you do now kind of thing? You're already, (laughs) you're a 29-year-old person already celebrating the 10th anniversary of one of your records, uh, and it's not your first record, so that's that's an even stranger <laughs> yeah. bit. I mean, I don't know what you do after that, uh, but it's exciting. It's not. I don't mean to sit here and like try to sound drab, <laughs> but it's but it really does like kind of force you to think about like what you've like where you've come from, what you've been doing, and what you want to do, uh, you know, and how you want to do it, and and also you reflect on how things have changed. And that's been the funniest thing on this tour is that we realize that a lot of things have not changed. <laughs> The gear has changed. The gear has changed, that's true. I think we've become a better band. We write, uh, maybe like not better songs to everybody, but as songwriters, we feel like we're always getting better, which is good. Um, yeah, the gear has changed. Definitely The Great Awake didn't have an orange, uh, you know, like a blend of like a Vox combo and an orange combo on that record. I mean, but that record was pretty punk, so... <laughs> <laughs> Was, is there, was, there a bit of te- was there a bit of trepidation, like, revisiting? Not really. I mean, like, you mean, did it, did, like, did anyone get upset? No, was it like, fuck, we need to think about maybe playing some songs we haven't played for a long oh, time. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, maybe oh sorry, I person. misunderstood your question. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, my God, yeah. That, like, absolutely. I just mean, like, the, the habits are the same, and, mm-hmm. you know. But, yeah, deep down, I think we're all different people ten years later. I think you kind of have to be. Uh... No, I mean, we've been practicing a lot of those songs on this tour because of those shows we have coming up. Uh, And it's been really funny to play the song at Soundcheck. Uh, It could be any of these songs, to be honest, off The Great Awake. We'll play it, and then if one of us can't remember a certain part, we'll be like, okay, let's listen to it. Hang on, let's listen to it. Just like a little guitar line or something. Some of these songs we haven't played in 10 years, you know what I mean? Um, And we'll go back and we'll hit play, and it's so much faster than what we just played. <laughs> so it's been kind of an endurance test for some of those songs. Uh, but it's been really fun to revisit all of them, to be honest. I mean, there were a couple where you're like, shit, this song is fucking weird. You know what I mean? Because you're a different kind of songwriter 10 years later. Uh, but it's been really cool to kind of dig back into that. And I think people are going to, if anyone um, is able to come to those Shows in Canada, not from Canada. I mean, I think, I hope it'll be, I don't mean like flying from super far away. I just mean if someone drives from like Detroit <laughs> four hours away. Uh, I hope it's worth it to them, you know, because it's, it's at least going to be worth it to us to revisit it and, you know, tip the proverbial hat to that era in our band's existence that really opened up a lot of doors for us. That's what I was going to say. It's like yeah. where it all begun, you know. It's like yeah. where the, the journey... That brought you right here, started yeah. all the way back then, and yeah. I can't imagine like see if it was if it was me, right? I don't think I would want to revisit it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because there's like a door I went through the door, and I kind of don't want to look back. Yeah, yeah I know what you mean. I mean, there was a little hesitation among a couple 
of us. Not me. I was very excited about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it, for, I think for that same reason, because then you start riding the nostalgia train, right? And that kind of that it it literally dates you when you celebrate the tenth anniversary of something. Uh, but it's also like a a mark of something to be very very proud of. You know what I mean? It's like a badge of honor almost. So. Yeah, I uh, I mean, the other thing, too, is, like, we've been out on tour so much this year playing a mix of all of our records that I thought it would be cool to give fans, especially, like, long-standing fans, uh, like, a different show mm-hmm. that they could come see. You know, because, obviously, it always has been, but even more so all the time, it becomes more and more about the live show of a band rather than a record or whatever. It's just the show now is how bands survive and how fans you know, get to interact with the band, really. Um, so, yeah, to see to see a band you might like play a record you like front to back is pretty exciting. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I've seen that a few times. I've seen, I've seen the NoFX play the Klein once. Yeah. And I was like, shit. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. They have this, they, I guess they had this rule where they would only play it once in every city. Mm-hmm. And I think they broke that rule a couple times. But they keep extremely tight-knit uh, organization of uh, their set list and, like, uh, you know, from this tour, this city, I think the next really? time they go back to the city, they'll have the last set list and know to play different songs. And, yeah, they, they give a huge shit about, about you know, like, because you know, like, a NoFX fan is going to go see NoFX forever. You know what I mean? And a lot of NoFX fans have been fans of theirs forever. So it's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. The decline rule... I back fully. Uh, I've been lucky enough to see it a couple times and play it a couple times, and that was the most fucked up thing, man. It was sick. Oh, my God. I played, like, the end when Hefe gets on his trumpet. Oh, fuck, man. (laughs) It was nuts. Oh, my God. What was that like? Crazy. Uh, The first time was in Dublin, and uh, Rugley, their guitar tech, Brian Rugley, he handed me, or sorry, he was talking to me uh, while they were playing the song, and he's like, okay, Hefe's going to hand you his guitar, but the volume knob is going to be turned down. He always turns it down, you know, to get his trumpet out and everything. And he's like, I don't know why he does it, because he doesn't, he doesn't have to, because I'll, I'll, I'll kill it for a second or whatever. But uh, anyways, he does this, so just know. Okay, cool. I say, all right. So I get up there, and he gives me his guitar. And I'm 21 at the time, I believe, maybe 20. Uh, freaking out. This is incredible. Playing with one of my favorite bands, you know what I mean? And this fucking song is just, oh man, it's one of the best fucking punk songs ever. And uh, I, anyways, I forgot to turn the volume knob back up. So I'm just like rocking out, like to nothing. <laughs> and then I look over and he's like, turn it up, dude. Like just pointing up to the fucking ceiling. Oh fuck. And I, I missed like a whole section of the song. I was still playing technically yeah. for the record, but no one heard it. Uh, I was just too excited. Fuck, man. Yeah. I mean, it would have been kind of weird if I just, like, cold and calculated walked out there like, fucking here we go. Whoop. Yeah. Got up right in. You know? <laughs> yeah. That was that was wild. But but that's the kind of people that no effects are. You know, the rule of playing the decline only once per city out of respect for how special that is, you know? And that's a story people can tell as well. And sharing the road with, I mean, you know, Mike obviously having fat records and stuff, like, he can share the road with a lot of his bands and give them that really good leg up um, to playing in front of people they wouldn't have probably, in, you know, otherwise. Uh, and, like, no effects on all their crew, man. Super generous people, very welcoming, very intimidating if you're a fan, of, obviously, just because they're fucking no effects. But, yeah, it's it's really cool. And I always really respected that they kept track of their set list like that, and they wouldn't, or they would try their best to, like, not play the same set. Uh, don't, play Scott, don't play Scotland anymore, so... Oh, man, that's right. Yeah. Oh, shit, yeah, oops. <laughs> that's too bad. But it's, it's weird that uh, a friend of mine went seen them was backstage at Girls Rock a couple of years ago when he came off stage, and he said something about being Scottish, and I was like, I'm never going there again. <laughs> <laughs> and that fucking whole thing went down, like, years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, fuck, probably before you guys were a band. Yeah, probably, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I was actually at that show, and... Fucking that story is scary. Yeah. yeah, it's scary, but I mean, would people remember? Probably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, to go back a little bit, you've been doing a lot of touring this year. This is the most touring you've done for a little while, hasn't that? For in a year? Uh, probably for, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Because we've basically been out on tour since I saw you last. Mm-hmm. We've 
I think we've, like, with a couple of small breaks here and there, we've been out for about six months. Uh, that's a pretty long amount of time to be out on the road for. And we're, like, we only have four, five more shows after night, four more shows after night. And then we go home for two days. Then go to the fest. And then we go home for a month. And then we have, like, 12 more shows before the end of the year. So we still have a lot to go. Um, but I guess, yeah, in the last couple of years, like, it's funny because in the, uh, I don't know, like, promotional cycle for Inviting Light, people kept talking about how, like, we took, like, a year off and didn't do anything, but we still went to, like, Europe, mm -hmm. Australia, Japan, Canada, the U.S. Like, we still toured all the time. I don't know. That, that was some weird folklore that made it out there. I don't know why. We toured a lot less than we normally did, but we still toured. Uh, but not in a big chunk like this. I think year to year you tried a different approach obviously a year you put a new record out you gotta hit it pretty hard because like I said like the show is what is you know uh, bringing everyone together and making you know uh, I don't know how to describe it properly just the show is what it is you know that's what it's about um, but there are years where we'll tour for a month and then go home for two months and then tour for two weeks and then you know it's so back and forth uh, it's hard to find a balance to figure out what really works for you and everyone else because everyone's different, first of all, and everyone's always changing. And your priorities, as we talked about earlier, shift as well. So you kind of just got to fucking ride that wave, you know? This one, of like, the wave this year is a fucking tidal wave because it's, <laughs> you know, just six months. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, I mean, it's been going really well, and we've been, like, really lucky to tour some really great bands. Like, Prawn have been out with us this whole tour. Ship Present in the UK, Not Scientists in Mainland Europe. Before that, we did shows with Smith Street Band on the, on the West Coast. We were able to do Riot Fest. We were able to uh, play with Pew Pew Pew, who's a really great brand from Toronto, and Garrett Dale from Red Sea Radio. We did Across Canada with the Dirty Nail and Sam Coffee and the Iron Lungs. And then before that was the Menzingers Dirty Nail Tour here. I know I'm forgetting some shit. We started the fucking year touring with Weezer, which was insane. Yeah. Uh, you know, and like, yeah, it's been crazy. And then before the end of the year, we're going to see the Menzingers again. We'll see probably our best friends we've ever made playing music, which is a Wilhelm Scream for those album shows. And then we get to end our year playing two shows with the Descendants. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> That's a lot of time on the road, man. All of that in a year. Yeah, I mean, you know, but it's... I think you gotta know, unless you wanna be a band that puts records out, doesn't really tour much. I mean, like, for instance, I am very surprised, but very excited to see how much uh, Propagandy's touring around their new record, because they don't usually tour a lot, even if they put something out. They'll do, you know, a string of dates here, a string of dates there, but it's very mysterious, and I love that about them. Uh, but they're touring a lot on this new one so far. Um, Still haven't heard that in Stanley. Oh, man. It's good. <laughs> you know, but there are bands who want to put out records and, like, barely play shows. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Totally. You know what I mean? Um, but I think if you're... I th for some reason in the punk world, I think you're either a band that wants to be that kind of band, like, make records, not tour much, for whatever reason, or you have to tour all the time. <laughs> well, the Senders kind of did that. I mean, this day they were like very, very intermittent because obviously yeah. Milo was working and mm -hmm. now they've just been fucking hitting it really hard. Dude, on the oh my God, like every weekend of the year pretty much. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, I mean, that just, like, that kind of seals it for you. Like they've, they've been a band for so long and they put a record out. That record came out, did that record come out last year? I think it was last year, yeah. Technically, yeah, I think so. Year, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck, I could be wrong, though. The years really blur together. <laughs> but that's a result of, you know... Age. This kind of life and fucking age, yeah. That is an interesting thing, though, is that uh, even though, you know, me and all the guys in the flats are all turning 30 this year, um, it's not old by any means, but I think, like, tour years exist in the way, like, dog years or cat years exist. I don't know if we talked about this last time. I think I may have done Okay. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, yeah, I just think, like, it's funny to see... You know, earlier I said, like, the habits are the same, and, yeah. but deep down we are different people, which is which are both true. Um, it's funny to see how these little things change, though. Like, how quickly you can bounce back from, like, a big night out. Or, uh... Does that get easier on tour? Uh, I mean, sometimes you don't have to drive. Like, it's not the coolest shit I've ever admitted, but, like, you can be drunk the whole time if you want to be. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... You don't have you never you never have to bounce back if you're if no, you've yeah. if you've never gone fully out because yeah. you know what I mean I don't know how to properly describe it but 
Uh, like your body's not getting a break, so it's just kind of fuck exactly. Just like chugging along. That's the th- yeah, and like for me personally, like that's been the main, the main difference I've noticed is uh, like I got to be a lot more careful about my voice, which is kind of too bad because it means. I mean, on the Carry the Banner podcast, I was talking to Greg and Tom from the Menzingers about this thing. Like, we've all kind of came to this realization as singers that going to a bar after a show is probably the worst thing you could do. But it's so fun to see these these friends in every city, and that's what everyone wants to do. So every once in a while, you're like, yeah, fuck it, let's do it, whatever. How bad could it be? And then the next day, you could be fine, or you could be fucking toast. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's such a thin line between one and the other. Um that's the scariest thing, not scariest, that's, that's pretty dramatic, but <laughs> that's the uh, that's the biggest variable, I think, for me, is, I mean, even, like, today, like, I got, when we were walking here, like I was telling you, I feel just fucking rocked and rolled. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm just a human appendage connected to a guitar at this point, just because I've been out on the road all year, uh, you know, and there's, but there's good days and bad days, and, like, the, the, I think one of the best things you can do for your mental sanity on the road uh, is just to fucking, if you have a bad day, you have a bad day. If my voice is kind of fucked up one night, it sucks, but... There's nothing you can do. I mean, I'm just a person, Mm -hmm. so, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, because the moment you really start to stress about it and worry about it and, and put all of your time and strength into being concerned about how it will go, it will get worse and worse and worse, you know? I'm in a band, and we... We would we would like to tour a lot, um, but I I can't believe I'm going to say this, but now if the guys hear this, they're probably going to punch me. <laughs> but um, one of the reasons I've been a little less uh, uh, like obviously nowhere on the same level as you guys, so I have to book the shows, which is fine. <laughs> um, but one of the reasons I've not been pursuing it yeah. as as much is because I worry a lot about my voice because there's been mm. some shows I've done one show and the next day I, I can't talk. I mean, for some folks, it's it's tough to keep that going, man. I can't believe. Having seen the Bronx live twice this year, and just love that band and all these things. How is his voice still even a thing? I don't know. It's insane to me how Matt can do that. Like, watching them live, they're incredible. And he's amazing, and his voice is so perfect. It's imperfect as well, obviously. That's why we all love it, because it's fucking gnarly. Mm -hmm. But I just mean perfect that, like, it sounds like the album. And the album sounds insane. Mm-hmm. And every time I see them, he, he makes it look so effortless. You know, uh, like the way he sings has got to be so abusive. And the way I sing, I know is very abusive. Like I've done, I've seen the physical damage I've done. Have you actually to, seen? Oh yeah, like fucking, like all, pretty much 10 years ago. I've had I the camera up my nose and that's, that's oh yeah. Off. Mine's is fine though. That's, that's <laughs> oh man, I fucking, I had a camera go down my throat about 10 years ago. And I saw what my vocal cords looked like, and they were fucked. Uh, and they urged me to have surgery. I never did it. This was right before we came to Europe for the first time ever. And I just kind of learned how to sing around the fucking scar tissue that had, you know, uh, whatever, kind of assembled on my vocal cords in a way. And that's why I think it's easier for me to get gnarly if I want to with my voice but I mean it's definitely also the reason why I can so easily blow up my voice out you know what I mean I don't want to be part of the no fun club but see (laughs) see as I have been driving and not drinking the shows it's been my voice has been like so much better than really? it, the next day. Like, Excellent. Honestly, like uh, I thought, oh, it's just a myth. Like they're just, they're just singing teachers that say don't do that because yeah, yeah, yeah. you know they don't want you to kill yourself. But no, it, it genuinely helps. No, of course. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, who was it? I read like an article recently. It was a Vice article, I think, and it was like Chris Farren was in it. Drew Thompson from Single Mothers, Canadian band, yeah, was in it. Um, was Dave Haas in it too? I just know that he's quit drinking. But either way, there was a, I think Dave may have been in it, but, uh, you know, these singers are talking about the biggest changes they found in themselves once they quit drinking, and they said that they could sing so much better. So, something to think about, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> has, has it changed your voice? Um, like, have you noticed Like, all changed? the shit that I've done yeah, to it? Do you notice it changing over the years? Like, see when you go out and tour after not being on tour for a bit. Oh, yeah, better. yeah, I think it's, I think that's one of the things that I, I can't bounce back, or maybe, maybe a better way to put it is I can't, 
slip into again as easy as I used to be able to. Like earlier this year, we had, I think the longest break we've had is we had three weeks off between tours. And the fir- after the first show back, after three weeks off, my throat was fucked. Like I could sing still, but and you use like certain different muscles to sing than you do to speak. But when I was speaking, it was pretty cracky or just dry. I find I get really dried out more than like my voice will just go away. Uh, and then like it feels that shitty, so you think it sounds that shitty, but there's some trick your fucking body and your mind are playing on you at the same time where it probably doesn't sound that different. It just feels a lot different. Um, that's That was like a funny thing to me. And I saw a friend a few days in, and I was like, man, my fucking voice, like my throat is killing me. And my voice is so dry, or my throat is so dry. And he was like, yeah, you had a few weeks off. Did you sing at all? I was like, no, not really. I took a fucking break, dude. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that that was enough for him to... You know, like the doctor was in, <laughs> and he just said, "Yeah, you have to keep singing like all the time." It's like going so to the gym. exactly, yeah, it's a muscle. You know what yeah. I mean? And it's so yeah. It, that's that's definitely become like I warm up a lot more now. I I try to take a lot better care of myself, but I do drink and I do chat and I do this. I don't, yeah, you know what I mean. So it's again, if you have a bad day, you got a bad day. If you blow your voice out and you're still on the road two weeks after with nothing in you, I mean, maybe you should have canceled the last week of shows and gone home, which sucks to do. It never feels good doing that, but... I've seen bands do that and struggle through it. Like, you can tell it maybe at some point, a week or so before, the singer's voice is gone, because yeah. it sounds, like, painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. you kind of go, I admire that, but also, that's probably going to hurt you. Yeah, I mean, we'll see how it goes for me tonight. I just, like, I just feel like, like, if, like, I'm having one of those days today where I just feel kind of shitty. Uh, but, I don't know, sometimes those days you can still sing. Yeah. So I just try not fucking, like, I have no problem talking about it, but, like, when I have time alone and I just keep swallowing and it feels weird, I'm like, oh, no, and you start freaking out, that's just, you just set yourself on a, a path to further destruction. I don't know if this will help you, but one thing that's helped me is, it sees immediately after we play the final part, which has singing in it and the set, I immediately start humming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to warm down. Yeah. And that does, yeah, that sure. certainly helped, helped yeah. me. Um, but that's the only advice I could probably give. <laughs> Someone as seasoned as yourself. Um, well, Chris, it's I'm been, trying. It's been a good fun chat again. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking to you. Is there anything else you want to say or anything you want to add before we get Ooh. out of this really warm? Car? Yeah, it's really foggy in here now. <laughs> yeah. Too much really speaking. Steamed it up. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think I'm just happy to be back so soon. And I mean, it's been a really, really cool year. Just listening off those bands we were able to play with this year, like I'm fans of all of theirs. And it's been really cool sharing the road with a lot of great people. So That's so awesome, yeah. man. Yeah. Good to hear that you're you're such a happy guy. Trying to stay happy, baby. <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> Teach me how you know. Oh, I don't know. It's uh <laughs> there's a lot of darkness behind this smile, dude. No, there's not really. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. I live a pretty good life. I have a an amazing group of friends and I have a really excellent partner in my life and a good family and I get to travel the world playing music. I can't really complain about a lot, you know? That's a good thing to end on, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I think Chris is my favourite guest I've ever had in this podcast. I mean, I'm not just saying that because the Flatliners are basically my favourite band ever at this point, but it's because he's one of the easiest dudes to talk to and he just has absolutely no ego whatsoever. He's just a delight. He's a constant delight. That also translates to when the band play on stage as well, obviously. He comes across a very affable chap. But on the whole, yeah, he's just a really, really good guy. And he's also the perfect guy to actually have his own podcast. So I'm really, really glad he decided to go ahead and do that. We spoke a little bit about podcasting the last time I spoke to him. After the interview had finished, he said that he was keen on doing it. So I'm super, super happy that he's went ahead and done it. If you haven't checked it out already, I thoroughly recommend Carry the Banner. It is really, really good, as you could probably expect. I should probably say this now, that in a month's time, which is a month from today, I will be at Book Your Rain Fest in Dundee doing a live podcast show. Details about that will follow in the coming days. If you're going to the festival though, do fire me an email or drop me a tweet or something like that and we can maybe say hi to each other. Always eager to meet you guys, so yeah, it would be awesome. That's all for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. If you haven't already, I would love it if you could subscribe to this podcast. It's pretty straightforward. Just hit the subscribe button in whatever podcasting app you're currently using. Also, if I could trouble you for a rating and review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, I'd really, really appreciate that. More ratings and reviews means this podcast grows in popularity on iTunes system. That means more people see it, and that is kind of what we both want from this transaction, I think. 
Until next time, bye-bye.